Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Dan Roth. Well, I'm ready to get into the Word of the Lord. How about you guys? You guys ready to get in the Word? <laughs> Praise God. Let's do this. Stand to your feet if you have the ability. I'm going to get down on my knees and let's go before the Lord together in prayer today. Father, we come to you today in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we're grateful that we get to come into your house openly, freely. God, this is not a have to for us. This is a get to, God. We're, we're grateful we get to be in your presence today. Experience your power, God. Count to your presence, Lord. And thank you, God, that today as we open up your word, that you open it up to us. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to have a good understanding. Lord, may we be the good ground where the word is sown. May it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. Truly today, Lord, we did not come to hear from a man or a woman, from the young or the old, the black, the white, the brown, or any other color. God, we don't want to hear about man's opinions or ideologies or philosophies. We want to hear from you. So Holy Spirit, be our teacher, be our guide. You're welcome in this place. Give us the vision, the wisdom, the direction, the instruction, even the correction that we need. Lord, discipline us so that we can be all that you call us to be and do all that you've called us to do. God, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we'd ask it for all the churches that are preaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. Lord, there are brothers and sisters. No time do we think of ourselves any better than anybody else, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building your kingdom. So God bless all the Baptists and Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostals. God, we thank you for Calvary Chapel and Harvest, Oak Valley, for the well and the way, for Ecclesia and Trinity and Emmanuel Baptist, God. Lord, we bless all of our Catholic brothers and sisters and Adventist brothers and sisters, Lord, for the assemblies that are joining together today, God. And Lord, for the Foursquare denomination, God, those that are lifting up the name of Jesus, we bless them. You would bless us this day. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say? Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. Get your Bibles out and go with me to Hebrews, the 10th chapter. Today, as you're turning to Hebrews, the 10th chapter, the title of the message is A Bold Christian Life. We're going to find out what that means in a moment, but Hebrews chapter 10, talking about a bold Christian life. Hebrews chapter 10, we're going to read verse number 19 through verse number 22. Hebrews, the 10th chapter. Starting out in verse number 19, says, therefore, now, if you've been around this church for any period of time, you know that therefore is there for a reason. In other words, because of what I just said. Now, the last time we were together in the book of Hebrews, Pastor Jim taught a phenomenal message about being sanctified. The moment of salvation, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ washes and cleanses our life, and we are sanctified, we are set apart, we are holy before the Lord, and we are His, one with Him. And yet, sometimes we wonder, well, then, if I'm pure in the sight of the Lord, and I'm cleansed of my sin, then why do I still do some of the things that I do in the flesh? And the explanation of that is that we are, yes, sanctified in the spirit, but we are being sanctified in the natural. There's still a process of sanctification going on, and we are changing into the image of the Lord in our minds, renewing our minds, and now in our actions. So because of that, because of that sanctification, because of the process we're going on with God, therefore... Verse number 19, brethren, having boldness, everybody say boldness, boldness, to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Verse 20, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. Verse 21, and having a high priest over the house of God. Now, we've talked about the high priest a bunch. In fact, the high priest is the main point of the things that we are saying, if you read in the book of Hebrews chapter 8. Having a high priest over the house of God. Take a look at it with me next, verse, verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now, I would love to go into everything that these verses have to say, but we would literally be here for months expounding on the things that these verses contain. There is so much chalked into these verses of goodness and, and of understanding a richness. Now, this is not meant to be fast food. This is not 30 seconds or less or your meal is free. This is good food for us. And that's why we take our time. We go line upon line, precept upon precept. Today, I want to zero in on verse number 19 where it says, now, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. We talk about a bold Christian life. Notice that the verse does not say uh, we should have boldness. Notice the verse doesn't say it'd be a good idea to go out and get some boldness. I want you to notice the verse doesn't say you should muster up some courage so that you can be bold. No, it says, therefore, brethren, having boldness. Highlighted both words for our understanding today. 
Because it is something as Christians, because of who Jesus is and because what he's done on the cross, and now because he's seated at the right hand of God, that we as the church of Almighty God have boldness. We ought to be the most outspoken, the most frank, the most transparent people on the face of the planet. Why? Because we have boldness. And yet, when I look around the church, and when I look in Christian lives, as I encounter people, I look around and I kind of scratch my head and go, where is the boldness? See, we're lacking boldness in our lives. Why? Well, a couple of reasons why. There's some things that hinder boldness. Things in our life that hinder boldness. First one is ignorance. Ignorance. People just don't know who Jesus is. And I'm talking about Christians now, okay? Not not talking about people that are not Christians. I expect them to not know who Jesus is. But even in the church, we, we don't have a biblical understanding of who Jesus is. We don't realize the fullness of what he's done on the cross and how he went to the grave and was raised again on the third day according to the scriptures. We don't realize that now we have a high priest who is seated at the right hand of God making intercession on our behalf and that he's for us. He's not against us. He loves us. He's pushing us forward and moving us into great things in our See, if we understood who our Jesus is, who our king is, then we would be a lot more bold. It's okay to say amen today, that I, that I might tell you that, okay? And yet we're ignorant. Sometimes we're ignorant not of who Jesus is. We understand who Jesus is, but we don't know who we are in him. See, when you get a hold of who you are in him, all of a sudden it doesn't matter what people think of you. It doesn't matter what people say about you. Why? Because I know who I am. I am not only who I am, but who I am in him. See, in him, I am a king's kid. In him, I'm an overcomer. In him, I have all sufficiency. See, in him, I have. In him, I am. In him, I live and move and have my being. I don't even breathe without him. And because of who he is and who I am in him, I can now be bold. See, sometimes we're ignorant. Sometimes people, uh, you know, foolishly say, well, you know, Christians are supposed to be loving and kind, and and if you're bold and frank, then then, you know you're going to make waves, and people aren't going to like you, and they're not going to want to be a Christian. Christian, you need to be a lot more loving, right? And, and, And yet, I look at that, and I say, well, hold on a second, hold on a second, because God is love. Is that right? First John, the fourth chapter, we know that, verse number eight. God is love. Jesus is God because he's the word. The word was with God. The word was God, John chapter 1. So therefore, Jesus is God, and that means that Jesus is love. Jesus is love in the flesh, love incarnate. And when I look at the life of Jesus, Jesus was loving and kind, yet he wasn't always kissy, kissy, lovey, lovey, huggy, huggy. And everybody just, do whatever you want to do. It's okay. I love you. No. What did he do? He said, you're going to come into my house and sell and trade and turn this into a den of thieves. And what does he do? He overturns tables. He braids a quarter whips and he starts whipping butts and getting people kicking out get out of my father's house this is going to be a house of prayer he had the pharisees and the sadducees and the religious leaders of his day so stark or even mad they gnashed their teeth at him and they went and plotted to kill him see i think we need to get a new definition of love don't you see love is personal self-sacrifice for the betterment of someone else. And it's not always kissy-kissy, lovey-lovey, huggy-huggy, do whatever you want to do. No, you can't do whatever you want to do because I love you enough to tell you the truth that foolishness is going to lead you to hell and I don't want you to go to hell. Why? Because I love you and I hope that doesn't offend you. But even if it does, it's all right, bro, because I love you. I got your back. Hello. See, the disciples, what about them? You know, that's Jesus. We could write that off. Oh, that's just Jesus. You know, he's God, and they didn't understand. What about the disciples? They're mere men. Oh, no, they're not mere men. They're men with the ability of God. Now, the Spirit of God gets on the inside of them. They start to speak boldly. What happens? All the world is in an uproar over them. They show up to town, and people gather together and say, well, what are we going to do? The men who have turned the world upside down have now come here, too. Paul shows up, and riots start breaking out. They actually had to carry Paul, the soldiers had to carry Paul because he was getting beat up so bad, they had to carry him out of the place because riots were breaking out, people were fasting to try and kill him, all this kind of stuff. And and, and yet, were the disciples huggy-huggy, kissy-kissy? Oh no, they were loving, but they were bold. They were going to tell you about Jesus, and they were going to tell you how it is. 
See, but we're ignorant of these things. We don't understand these things. Things that hinder boldness. Another one that plagues the church today. Plagues our society, really, if you will. Because people want to be called a Christian, and yet something hinders them from being bold as a Christian. Here it is. Apathy, lethargy, and divided allegiance. Apathy, lethargy, and divided allegiance. You say, well, what is apathy? Apathy is this. I don't care. I'm apathetic. I, I, I really just, you know, I want to be a Christian, but I, you know, I don't really care to be bold for Jesus, you know, and, and they view their Christianity as like a triple A membership, you know, and so therefore I signed up for it. I've got it. I got the sticker on my car, but I'm not going to make any waves. I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to be bold for Jesus. Why? Because I got mine and I just don't really care about anyone else or anything else. I'm a Christian. It's fine. That's just how it is. Listen, this is not a triple A membership. You have not joined a club. You have a new nature on the inside of you and you ought to care. You ought to allow the Spirit of God to be like a fire in your bones where you wanted to shut up, but indeed, you cannot. What about lethargy? Lethargy is just, I'm too tired. You know, I've spent all my energy and all my effort. I've been working hard. You know, the wife and the kids, they've been on my back. My boss has been on my back. Everybody get off my back. You know, I got bills to pay. I got things to do. And I'm so spent that at the end of the day, I don't have anything left over for God. I just can't be bold for Jesus. I just got to do my thing. And that's all I have energy for. That's lethargy. And yet God says, stir yourself up. God says, don't allow yourself to slump back into sleep. No, you need to awaken to righteousness. You need to get up. You need to be bold for Jesus. And you need to draw your strength from the Holy Spirit. Because those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. And they will soar with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not grow faint. What about this one? Divided allegiance. What's that all about? Well, you know, yeah, uh, I got friends, and you know, they're not Christians, and I'm trying to win them to Jesus, but I, I don't want to push them away, you know? And so if I'm bold, and I'm frank, and I'm open of speech around them, you know, they're going to get offended. Well, can I tell you something? The gospel is an offense. That's what the Bible says. It says to the Greeks, it was a stumbling, they didn't understand it, right? To the Jews, it was a stumbling block. It was an offense. The death of Jesus is offensive to people. They don't want to stare at a naked man bleeding and suffering on a cross. They don't want to look at injustice in the face and see God as love hanging on a tree for their sin. That is offensive to people. To us, it's the fragrance of life, but to them that are dying, it's the fragrance of death, the Bible says. It is an offense, and divided allegiance will keep you from being bold. Why? Because you think, well, I don't want to make any waves. I don't want to push anyone away. I'm just going to love them. Again, you've got to get a new definition of love. Because the gospel is an offense, and friendship with the world is enmity towards God, the book of James says. You cannot have a divided allegiance. You have to be 100% wholehearted, sunk into your allegiance with God, and because you're loyal to God, I don't care what people think of me. I don't care. Listen, it's going to offend, but let me love you enough to tell you the truth. Here's how it is. If you continue in that activity, it's going to drag you down to hell, and I don't want you to go to hell. I want you to be with me and Jesus forever and eternity in heaven. And you know what? If it pushes people away, then you know it's time to go and tell someone else about Jesus. Jesus said, don't cast your pearls before swine or in front of the dogs to trample them underfoot, and then they turn and trample you. Listen, if they go their own way, then you know what? Here's what you do. You pray for them, and you ask the Lord of the harvest to send laborers across their path. God knows how to get a hold of their heart. And if you really care about them, you'll love them enough to tell them the truth. Be bold about your relationship with Jesus Christ. Not put up with junk and let them spew their worldly vomit all over you. No, I'm going to stand clean before God. I'm not going to dive in with you. I'm going to stand back here. Why? Because I'm loyal to my God. And if you don't like it, that's okay. I love you, and I will pray for you. It's not cold-hearted, it's real love. What about this? Fear. Fear. See, there's many voices, including our own, that are constantly talking to us and telling us to be quiet, telling us, don't make waves. What's going to happen? What will people think? Fear will literally shut us down and shut us up. Fear is a great hindrance to being bold. And yet, if you're going to combat that fear that comes on, what, 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 what's going to happen? If you're going to combat that, you need to fill up with faith. See, because if you fill up with faith, then when the pressure comes and squeezes you, if you're full of faith, what's going to pour out of you when the squeeze comes on? Faith, right? Because that's what you put in, that's what you're going to get out. 
And so if you fill up in faith, then when the fears try and come, when pressure's trying to come, when the squeeze comes on, and it's time to be bold for Jesus, out of your mouth is going to come what you filled up with, faith. You're going to start talking faith. You're going to walk faith. You're going to have faith. And it doesn't matter what happens to me. It doesn't matter if I lack. You can take it all away. Why? I'm bold for Jesus. I've got God on my side. He's going to take care of me. He loves me. You may not like me. I don't care. I got a God who loves me. Things that hinder boldness, last one is this, sin. Sin. This started with our father, Adam. Remember, here's Adam in the garden, right? Him and Eve mess up. They sin. What's the first thing they do? They, they have the great cover-up, right? They sew together the fig leaves, and we're covering everything up, you know? And then they go and they hide. And here comes the presence of God, and God says, Adam, where are you? Now, God wasn't asking that for his own benefit. He was asking that for their benefit. God knew the answer. And what does Adam say? He says, I was afraid, therefore I hid. I messed up and I sinned, therefore I wasn't bold anymore. I wasn't out in the open. I wasn't transparent about who I am. Why? Because of sin. There was an issue in my life that I'm trying to cover up. See, in the same way many of us, you know, when, when we sin, when we mess up, we run from God rather than running to God. You know, if you're out Saturday night and you mess up, it's not time to skip church the next morning. Let me help you. It's time to get into church. It's time to cry. It's time to repent. It's time to wash your hands, you sinner. Hey, come on. Get into the flow of the cleansing stream of the Lord and repent. Confess your sin to God. God, I blew it royally. God, I messed up big time, Lord. But God, it's not greater than your blood. Forgive me, Lord. I repent. I turn from evil. God, I'm not going back there. God, I'm going to cut off that thing that took me there, whether it be a relationship, whether it be a television, whether it be an internet, whether it be a phone. Come on, somebody. Can we talk? Sin will keep you from being bold. See, how can I tell someone about Jesus if I can't even get myself together? Listen, you can't get yourself together. The mender of hearts is Jesus. The healer is Jesus. The one who takes care of sin is Jesus. Get Jesus on the inside. Allow him to do the work of, of, of holiness and to, to change you and rearrange you. And you tell someone about Jesus. You say, well, how can I do that? You say, well, listen, I haven't arrived. But I know God's doing a work in me. I haven't made it. I haven't yet attained like the Apostle Paul says. But I'm pressing on. I'm not going to allow that little road bump. But you know what? You can do it too. It's good for me. It's good for you. God is good. God loves you. And he'll take care of you. But, 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 but you sinned. Yeah, I sinned, but I gave it to God. He forgives me. He loves me. Now, that's not excuse. Does not excuse. Okay, don't get me wrong right now. Don't walk out of here and say, it's okay to sin. No. It's not okay. Stop it. Let's clean up our act and let's go into the highway of holiness. But if you do sin, if you do mess up, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, the Bible says. Those are some things that hinder boldness. So, so then if those things hinder boldness then, then, and we have boldness, then how do we be bold? If I have something, how do I use it? Do me no good to have something and I don't know what to do with it or how to do it. Is that right? So today, a couple of quick things. How to be bold. Number one thing for today, how to be bold is this. Stay in him. Stay in him. Stay connected to God. Stay in God's presence. How about this? Practice the presence of God. Live your life as if God is just linked up arm in arm, shoulder to shoulder with you. Everywhere you go, he goes. Everything you do, he does. Every word you speak, he hears. Every thought you think, he knows it fully. See, that's the reality of the life in Christ Jesus. When you were born of the Spirit of God, Jesus Christ came to live on the inside of you. Now on the inside, you are wall-to-wall -wall Holy Spirit. You are now infused with the power and the nature of God. Therefore, God is on the inside of you. You are on the inside of Him. And whatever you're doing, God is doing it right there with you. Whatever you're involved in, God's involved in. Whatever your effort is, there God's strength is. See, and if you can stay in Him, then you will be bold for Jesus. My wife and I, we have three small children, ages four to nine, and, uh, and, you know, maybe some of you parents out there can relate with this. When you put your children to bed, what happens? You know, you, you pray with them, you read the Bible to them at night, and brush teeth, and get jammies on, and you lay them down, you give them a kiss on the head, and you think that they're sleeping because their eyes are closed, and so you start to tiptoe out of the room, right? And there, as you're tiptoeing out of the room, you think you've made it. When you hit the doorway, and all of a sudden, what do you hear? <laughs> I 
and you stop. What is it, honey? Why are you leaving me? What's wrong? I'm afraid I want to be alone. And so what do you do? You sit there. I'm right here. I'm right here. I'm right here. Don't worry. Go to sleep, right? Well, we've been teaching our children, hey, it doesn't matter if mommy and daddy are in the room. Listen, first of all, we are right there, you know? Hey, you can see our room from your room. All you got to do, you wonder if we're here, just peek out the door. We're right there on our bed watching TV, getting ourselves ready for bed. We're in the same house, okay? But not only that, when mommy and daddy leave, Jesus never leaves. When mommy and daddy are gone, Jesus stays. He's still here. And so we started teaching them the scriptures so that even if they don't feel like God's there, that they can start to declare the word of God and bring God on the scene, bring God in their life. See, God never leaves. He, the Bible says he will never leave you nor forsake you. Therefore, you can be strong and of good courage. You can be bold about God. God is there. If you're wondering if God's going to back you, listen, he's there. He's already there. He's already backing you. God is with you wherever you go. And so the other night, my son, he was uh, my littlest one, my little four-year-old, he's putting on his jammies. And as, as we're getting ready for bed, he's dead, I'm scared. What are you scared of? I'm right here, you know? Yeah, I'm scared. I won't be alone. I said, listen, well, Jesus is with you. And all of a sudden, it was like the light switch flipped on in his mind. Oh, yeah. Yeah, God's with me. And so as he's putting on his jammies, I do not have a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. <laughs> and he laid down and went to sleep. I was like, yes, finally. <laughs> first John, turn there with me to First John. There in the New Testament, little John, First John. First John chapter 2. Take a look at a great verse, verse number 28. Now, I'm going to read it to you in a different translation, but I want you to find it in your own Bible because I want you to be able to get back to these verses. First John chapter 2, verse 28. I'm going to read it to you in the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Now, that was a mouthful, wasn't it? HCSB. Be up on the overheads if you want to follow along or follow along in your own Bible. First John chapter 2, verse 28. So now, little children. Don't you love that God calls us little children? Why is that? Because he knows our nature. He knows we're going to be afraid because we feel like he's not with us. So now, little children, look at this. Remain in him so that when he appears, we may have what? Well, I'm sorry. Six of you know. Look up on the overheads. So that when he appears, we may have what? boldness and not be ashamed before him at his coming. See, when you are in the presence of God, when you know that big brother is with you, his name is Jesus, right? It doesn't matter what's going down on the schoolyard. I got my big brother backing me up. So what you want to do now, right? See, and, 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 and doesn't matter. See, my dad can always whip your dad because my dad is Jesus. My, that's, my, that's my Abba. He's my father. He's going to take care of me. Devil, bring what you may. Come hell or high water, I will walk through the fire and not be burnt. I will come out on the other side and not smell like smoke. So number one thing is stay in his presence. Second thing, second thing is pray God's will. Pray God's will. God's will. Now notice up on the overheads I have for you in parentheses, God's will is his word. See, if you can go before the Lord and you can pray the will of God, think about this. If you knew that God had a prayer, that every prayer, every time you asked that question, the answer was yes, then you would pray that prayer, right? And yet, many times in our lives, we wonder, well, what's the difference between some Christians that pray and they get answers to prayers and other Christians that pray and they get nothing? What's the difference? The difference is, is praying in the will of God. If you know that it's according to God's will that you're praying, then you know the answer is yes, because God wants it to happen. Therefore, when you pray the God prayer, God's going to bring it to pass on the earth. Kind of neat, because Jesus was praying. His disciples saw him praying, saw the power of God manifested in his life. Something about the prayer life of Jesus so impressed the disciples that they went to him and they said, Master, teacher, teach us how to pray. You know, and so what does he do? He delivers them a model of prayer that he gives to them. We know it as the, the Lord's prayer, right? Our Father who art in heaven. Now, now, really, it's the disciples' prayer because the Lord is giving it to the disciples to pray. But then right after he delivers to them this model of prayer, what does he do? He tells them a parable. He starts to tell them a story. Now, I'm going to put it up on the overheads in the New Century Version because I like the way that it said it. But Luke chapter 11, verse number 5, in the New Century Version, starts out and says this. Then Jesus said to them, suppose one of you went to your friend's house at midnight. Now, now we got to stop right there and talk about this for a second. 
You show up to my house at midnight, we got issues. First of all, I'm a hard sleeper, so you're not going to be dealing with me. You're going to be dealing with Mama Bear, okay? So not going to happen. You come knocking at my door at midnight, you're going to get the boot, right? So suppose one of you goes to your friend's house at midnight and said to him, friend, loan me three loaves of bread. Now, not only is this guy bugging his friend in the middle of the night, now he's asking for something in the middle of the night. As if it wasn't bad enough he woke him up, now he's bugging him about giving him something. So let's see what happens. Why is he asking? What's he saying? What's he doing? Verse 6, a friend of mine has come into town to visit me, but I have nothing for him to eat. So in our society, we would say, well, so what? Food for less is open 24 hours a day. Go pick up some food, right? But in their society, in their culture at the time, they did not have food for less. They didn't have the 24-hour market. And so all they had was what they made for that day. And whatever they made for that day, normally they used up for that day. So here it is midnight. A friend has come from out of town. And in their society, in their culture, they, they, they were going to be hospitable. Not like us. You know, here's a couch. Here's a blanket. I'll see you in the morning. Whatever you find in the fridge, it's yours. Just don't bother me, right? That's, that's if you even opened the door at midnight for a friend coming in from out of town. You didn't. Wait, wait. What time? You showed up right now? Go find Motel 6, bro. And yet in their culture, it would be considered rude not to take them in and not to put food in front of them as soon as they got there. So here he says, a friend of mine has come to me from out of town. I have nothing to set before him to eat. Now look at the response of the friend. And this would have been my response, okay, if it was me. Verse number seven. Your friend inside the house answers, don't bother me. The door's already locked and my children and I are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. Verse number eight, here comes the moral of the story. Here comes Jesus telling us, look at this, I tell you, this is Jesus speaking, I tell you, if friendship is not enough to make him get up and give you the bread, your boldness will make him get up and give you whatever you need. Listen, did you hear what Jesus said? If friendship is not enough, your boldness is going to take care of it. If relationship is not enough, your boldness is going to get the answer. See, many times people think, well, I'm a Christian. Uh, shouldn't that be enough? I'm one of God's children. And so we ask, and yet we ask amiss. And yet it's not about the relationship in this instance. It's about our boldness. It's about our persistence. It's about our asking. It's about us being open and frank. And God, I have a need. God, I need you to show up. God, I need you to do this. God, I want you to move. Zion. Luke 11, verse 8, in the complete Jewish Bible, complete Jewish, completed Jew is really a Jew who has believed in the Messiah, Jesus Christ as Lord. So Luke 11, verse 8, in the complete Jewish Bible says, but I tell you, even if he won't get up because of the man is his friend, yet because of the man's chutzpah, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. See, I think in the church of Jesus Christ today here on the earth, we need to add a little bit of chutzpah. Everybody say chutzpah. Come on, say chutzpah. Oh, you got to add a little to it, you know? Don't, don't, don't add it to your neighbor. Sorry, bro. How do you know if you're praying the will of God? First John. You still first John? First John chapter 5 this time. First John chapter 5. Verse number 14, verse number 15. First John chapter 5, verse 14 says this. Now, this is the confidence. Another word for confidence is boldness. Now, this is the confidence that we have where? In him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Verse 15, and if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. Do you want to know how to get your prayers to go beyond the roof? You want to know how to get your, hair, your prayers not to bounce off the ceiling? Here's how. You've got to find out the will of the Lord. You've got to get into the word of the Lord. See, if you can get a hold of a promise of God, if you can find out what God has to say about your life, and then you go and you petition the throne, you boldly enter into the presence of God, and you say, God, I have a need. God, I have a petition. God, I need my healing. And God, your, your word says, Lord, by your stripes, I was healed. Then you know that God has heard you. God, I need, I need finances. And God, your word says that you shall supply all of my need according 
according to your riches and glory. How? By Christ Jesus. God, I know you hear me. God, I know you're going to come through. God, I know you're going to do it. See, now you've got prayers that are reaching into the throne room of God, getting the ear of God, and God will perform his word. That's chutzpah. <laughs> Last thing for today. How do we do this? How do we be bold? Third thing is obey God's word. Obey God's word. Let me make a statement to you. Boldness in his presence in private will turn out to be boldness in public. See, when you stay in the presence of God and when you pray in the God prayer, now all of a sudden when you go out into the job site... You're going to be bold for Jesus. Why? Because God's nature has gotten on the inside of you, and you cannot be anything other than what you are. Boldness in private will turn into boldness in public. When you go to the family dinner, everybody's about ready to start diving in the food. You say, wait, we need to pray. They're going to say, oh, now you're going to preach to me? Now you're going to tell me that you got Jesus? Listen, I wiped your butt when you were little. I, I changed your diapers. I, I, I wiped your snotty nose. I, I was the one spanking you when you went out on the street. And you didn't. now you're going to preach to me? No, I'm going to bless our food right now. And I'm going to pray in the name of my Lord, Jesus Christ. Thank you for this food. Bless it to our bodies. Bless all these heathens' food too. In Jesus' name, amen. You, you might want to edit that prayer a little bit. A <laughs> little too bold. <laughs> but you need to be obedient to God's word. I, I was so blessed on our vacation. My daughter uh, is just such a wonderful little girl. She teaches me so much about Jesus. I mean, all my life. I think the girl has literally prophesied to me at times. And, uh, and just she's a wonderful, wonderful teacher to me. And to our family of the things of God, we were taking a walk, and there was about nine of us on this walk. We were all going out, and uh, we had some nieces, nephews, and all that kind of stuff. My wife and I and sister-in-law were all walking, and, and we're going, and, and, you know, taking the little bike paths and trails and looking at little ponds and rivers and streams and, you know, the mountains and the beauty. And we're just getting some exercise and going out. And, uh, and, you know, so we come around, and we were coming around, and the place where we were staying had a golf course right next to it. It was an association, so they had, you know, like the, the homes, and then they had the golf course. So we wanted to go around the back side of the golf course, and there was a big field back there and some different stuff to see. And so we're trying to get back there so that we could come around and make a circle and come back to the house. And as we're going, we go up the street, and we thought we could make it through the street. We thought at the street, end of the street, it would open up. You know, you're looking on your phone, looking at the map. Oh, it looks like we can just go right here. And so we get up there, and we realize that there is houses in a cul-de-sac that end the street. And we didn't want to be rude and walk across anyone's yard and all that kind of stuff. And it just was like, ah, let's not go there. So we start to turn back. And as we turn back, we go back around, and we see the golf course, and there's an open field. You know, there's a place there where there was no houses, and there was this field, and you could walk across. And across the golf course was the houses that we were staying at. And so we said, well, why not just cut across? There's only two holes, and, you know, if no one's golfing, it's after hours, you know, and so it'd be safe. And, and we'll just send down out there to look both ways first before crossing, and then we'll go across, and we'll get to our house. And so that's exactly what we did. All nine of us go up to the edge of the golf course. I look both ways. I kind of step out a little bit and look down and make sure there's nobody golfing. You know, we don't want to hear four. And then one of the kids is knocked out. And so, um, so it was safe. You know, there was no, no sign of nothing around. And so I said, all right, everybody's safe. Let's go. So we all go running across the golf course. You know, here we are um, running across the golf course. My little nephews, they're doing the Mission Impossible thing. You know, they're rolling over and, you know, dun, 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 and, and, and they're doing their thing, right? And so we get across and we're all on the other side and we're like, all right, okay, let's go. And I look back and where's my daughter and where's my wife? And so I look across the golf course into the field and I see my daughter and my wife walk in the opposite direction. And I'm like, okay, what just happened? Thank God for cell phones, I call my wife on the phone. And I said, honey, what happened? And I hear this on the other end, I'm so mad right now. Your daughter. <laughs> right there you know there's a problem when she's my daughter now, right? <laughs> Your daughter wouldn't go. Why not? Because she saw a sign 
yesterday on the other side of the course that said no trespassing. So now, we have to walk miles around the golf course to get back. Okay, honey, just calm down. I'm going to go get uh, Luke's truck, and we're gonna, we'll, we'll come pick you up. Don't worry about it. I go, and I pick him up, and I come back, and we drive back to the house that we're staying at and park it. And, uh, and so here comes my daughter out of the truck, and I stop her, and I said, honey, I, I want to talk to you for a second. Now, no, not what you're thinking. I didn't discipline her. I didn't rebuke her. I didn't tell you you have to listen to mommy and daddy on every point, and if you don't do that, you're wrong or you're bad or any of that kind of stuff. I said, honey, listen, I want to commend you for something right now. I want to commend you for sticking to your guns. I want to commend you for not violating your own conscience, even in the face of very intimidating mom and dad, you know, because we can be very strong and very opinionated. And honey, I want to commend you that even though We were telling you it was okay that you had a check in your heart and you did not violate your own conscience. Before God, you stand pure and holy and upright before God because you did not go against what you knew to be right. And I told her, darling, when you get older, that's going to be a virtue in your life. That's going to be something that when the peer pressure comes on, when people are telling you to go do drugs or have sex or whatever that is, that's going to be going on in your life. Now, she's nine years old, so I did it age appropriate, you know. But I said, you know, when, when the peer pressure comes on, people are telling you to do stuff that you shouldn't be doing, you are going to stand up and you're not going to violate your conscience. Thank you for sticking to your guns. Now, come to find out, okay, just so that you know that Pastor Dan and Jess and, and, and your pastors didn't go trespassing on the golf course, remember, number one, we were staying at the association, so we belong there anyways, and number two, the sign that she saw was for a habitat that they were trying to keep, you know, it was like a marshy little place, and they said, no trespassing on this, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> okay, so we're fine, all right, we didn't do anything illegal. But how many of you have seen the sign? How many of you have seen the sign yesterday? How many of you have seen the sign? See, when you get the word of God into your heart, then you obey the word of God boldly in the face of opposition. Acts chapter 4, we'll end with this. Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, verse number 13. The apostles are preaching the word of God. See, they saw the sign. Jesus told them, go ye therefore into all nations, preaching the gospel, making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. They saw the sign, and therefore they started to preach boldly in the temple, boldly in front of the people. Now the religious leaders get mad, they get angry, they go and they gather up the disciples, and look at what happens, Acts chapter 4, verse number 13, look at this with me. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. See, we could look around this room and we could say, well, wait a second, you're from San Bernardino. You aren't educated. You're not trained. In fact, you're not really nice. You're not smart. Uh, This is the armpit of Southern California. Who are you? And yet, they'll marvel that God is doing something in a broken city, in a busted place, in a place that needs mending, in a place that has no hope. Why? Look at the last part of the verse. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. See, your boldness in private will turn into boldness in public. They're going to look at your life and say, wow, that person has been with Jesus. He's been with Jesus She's been with Jesus. They've been with Jesus. That family has been changed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Spurgeon wrote about Martin Luther, the Reformation father. He came out of his prayer closet and cried, Vici, I have conquered. See, he had not yet met his adversaries, but as he had prevailed with God for men, he felt that he should prevail with men for God. Today, what have we learned? Well, we learned that we need to be bold. We have boldness. What hinders boldness? Well, ignorance, apathy, lethargy. Divided allegiance, fear, sin. So then, so then how do we be bold? Number one, stay in him. Number two, pray God's will, his word. Finally, number three, obey God's word. Now, I'm a pastor. I'm a teacher. Hold on before we have a clap and a shout. I want to make sure that tomorrow morning, Monday morning, when you get up and you go to work, when you get up and you're home with the kids, when you get up and you're there alone looking at your day, 
I want you to remember what God is speaking to you today. You can be bold for Jesus Christ. You can have boldness in your walk with the Lord. So I made sure that my points today, the first word all rhymed so that you would remember it. Did you notice that? So what do we got? We've got stay, pray, obey. You think you can remember that? Stay, pray, obey. Come on, let's say it together. Stay, pray, obey. Let's say it with some boldness. Stay, pray, obey. Add some hut spot. Stay, pray, obey. You guys got it? Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. God is so good. I want to talk to you guys just a couple more minutes, then I'm going to let you go. You guys have been great today. Thank you guys for your attention, for your interest. I really do believe you got something from the word of the Lord. Today we've laughed together. We've heard the word of God. We've sang together. Just been a great time in church. It'd be a tragedy if we did all that and then we let you go and your heart stopped, you died, and you went to hell rather than going to heaven. You say, Pastor, whoa, man, you just got real serious on me. Yeah, I did because this is a serious thing. And I love you enough. Remember, we talked about changing our definition of love. I love you enough to get in your face and tell you the truth. Because if you die and your heart's not right with God, then you're going to go to hell. And I don't want that. You don't want that. And listen, most of all, God doesn't want that. Because God loves you more than you and I could ever dream or imagine. And let's make sure that you go to heaven and not hell. Sometimes people think, well, there is no hell. Listen, the Bible talks about hell, Old and New Testament. Jesus himself spoke of it. It's a very real place. Can't just bury your head in the sand and think that it's going to go away. You're going to have to deal with the reality of hell. Let's make sure you don't go there. Sometimes people say, well, I'm not going to go there because all roads lead to heaven. Well, you know, that's like saying all roads lead to the moon. You're not going to make it. You can drive around the earth as long as you want. won't make it. In the same way, you can't just do whatever you want to do and think that you're going to get to go to heaven. You think that God, after going to the cross, beaten bloody mess... You think he'd say whatever you want to do? Just you do your thing and they do their thing? Leave it up to you or me or some well-meaning church committee? No. He outlines exactly how to get to heaven in his word. Sometimes people think, well, I'll just be good. God lets good people into heaven, right? Wrong. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible says good people go to heaven? You can be good enough or your good outweighs your bad or do enough good deeds or give money to charity, you get to go to heaven? It's not there. What the Bible says is all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're not going to make it there on our own merits. You can't be good enough to get to heaven. Sometimes people think, well, I was raised in church. Parents told me we were Christians growing up. Took me to religious classes. Wore religious jewelry like a cross or a St. Christopher. They had me baptized to Christian as a child. Born in America. Not any other religion. Not Buddhist, Muslim, Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians going to heaven. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're raised in church, parents tell you you're Christian, you wear religious jewelry, attend religious classes, be baptized to Christian as a child, you're born in America, that you get to go to heaven? It doesn't work like that. You're not going to make it based on those things. I don't see anywhere in the Bible that because you're not some other religion that by default God loves you in the category of being a Christian headed for heaven denying your presence in hell. Come on, can we talk today? Let's talk about your eternal life. Sometimes people think, well, I'm going to get to go to heaven not only because when I was a child did I go to church. Here I am sitting in church in front of you right now, pastor. I, I consider myself to be a Christian. That's great. I'm glad you're here. But show that to me in the Bible where it says you sit in church service, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. That's like saying I could go to my house Sit in my garage, call myself a car, and that makes me a car. No, it's simply not going to work like that. You can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. You say, but, but hold on a second. My last church I got involved, I sang in the choir, made decisions. People thought of me as a leader. I, I even got a membership card to that church. It's great. I'm glad you got involved. But show me where your church involvement gets you into heaven. It's not there. Nor in the Bible say God's waiting at the gates of heaven, looking for your membership card to a church before you can enter. It doesn't work like that. Come on, let's talk about your eternal life. Sometimes people say, well, hold on a second, Pastor. Somebody told me that if I knew God, that makes me a Christian. I know God. I know about Jesus. I know about Easter and the resurrection. I sing the songs of Christmas every year of my life. I could quote scriptures to you, Pastor, Old and New Testament. Does that mean I'm a Christian? Well, the problem with that is if you'd read your Bible, you know demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians. The problem with that is the Bible records that the devil himself knows who Jesus is and can quote scriptures out of his mouth, and yet that doesn't qualify him for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. Look up here. It's not about what you have in your head. Not about mental ascent towards God, having head knowledge about who Jesus is, and that gets you right with God. Rather, this is about your heart. God's always been after your heart. Jesus said it like this. He said, you must be born 
again. Now, I know at that point, many of you in this room turn off and you say, ugh, born again, I heard about that, I saw it in a movie, read about it in a blog, you know, on, on the internet and, and, and saw it in a magazine about somebody who said they were born again. They're just weird, goofy, and I don't want to have anything to do with that. The problem with that thinking is if you don't have anything to do with being born again in the true sense, you're not going to make it to heaven because Jesus said you must be born again if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven. So what does being born again mean? Let's not let society or Hollywood, television, movies, or the internet define it. Let's let the Bible define it. What does being born again mean from the Bible? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and you've given God all of your life. It's just that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you in the book of Revelation, last book in the Bible. Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us here in this church today. And he says, when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold, because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are gross graphic words from the mouth of Jesus. But what is he saying? What's he talking about? Lukewarm. What's that? Well, it's a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down. A little token prayer every now and then. An occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So in a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So here's your opportunity. I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. Bang! Pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, just like that. Bang! That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying something. You're saying, I want to give God all of my heart. I want to give God all my life. Want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, 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 wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Yeah, you might be. Let's push past that embarrassment today. Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? And no one make that trade. No one's that dumb. Yet the devil thinks that you are. That's why he's trying to talk you out of it right now. Come on, let's push past that embarrassment. Let's go for God. Your choice, your call today. Sit there and do nothing when you know you need to get right. Or give God all of your heart and all of your life. Who should raise their hand in a moment? Have you been running from God instead of two? God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on, today, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus, given them all of your heart and all of your life? I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in this place? You know, that's the condition of your heart when I described it. You can get right with God. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching by television in the foyer and the Love Rock Cafe, you can raise your hand right where you're at and then tell an usher or come into the church service right afterwards or online. God's watching you online and then you can click the button, respond to God, or go to our homepage and click the button, respond to God, and someone will lead you in a prayer. Here we go. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, Three, let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me right now. If that's you, thank you. There's one. God bless you. Who else? There's two. God bless you. Ushers, I need some help. Thank you. Up there, there's three. God bless you. Where you at? Where you at? Just raise them up high. There's four. There's five. There's six. God bless you guys right over here. I got you. Up on top, seven. Thank you. God bless you. Over on this side, eight. Got you over there. Got you. Thank you. Nine, 10, 11. Got you guys over here. Thank you. 12 in the family room. Anybody else that I didn't already see? There's a dozen wise people. That's you. You need to give God all of your heart. You need to give God all of your up there. Thank you. Thank you. 13. Who else? We're at number 14. 14 up there. Thank you. God bless you. Oh, don't you just know there's 15? Where are you at number 15? Sitting there wondering if you should do this. Yeah, you should. Go for it. Go for it. Where are you at? The ushers are pointing over here. We got way on the other side. Got you over there, number 15. All right. And number 16. And number 17. Praise God. Well, hey. Wait, 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 wait. You're going to scare away my fish. Shh. You don't throw rocks in the water while someone's fishing. Okay. 18, 19, and 20. 18, 19, 20. God bless you. Now, let's give the Lord a great big praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Here's what we want you to do. Now, listen. 
the preacher preached too long because you guys were just amen and too good, okay? And I loved it. So I want you quickly, quickly now, quickly, get a hold of your cold purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Get your stuff, get in the aisle and meet me up front. If you're in the family rooms, you can bring your children. They're okay to come in right now, okay? Even if you didn't raise your hand, but you know you should have, come on, you can come too. This is your time. No one leaves during this time. Very hard to get people to come forward. When you're going that way, we want to get them this way, all right? So let's all stand and welcome them. If you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, you come right now. Come on down to the front. Come on, come on, come on. Jesus, I believe. Even if you didn't raise your hand, you could come too. Come on, make your way to the front right now. Jesus, I belong. From the family rooms, bring your children. Come on, they'll remember this. You're the reason that I live. All 20 of you. You're the reason that come on down. I breathe. Jesus, I Come on down believe. if that's you. You raise your hand or you should have. In Not too late. Come on. Jesus, I belong to you. Come on, come on, come on, come on. You're the reason that I live. You're the reason that I You can come too. This is your time. This is your Jesus, moment of salvation. I believe in you. Anybody else, if you need to come, you just make it way to the front right now. Come on down. Come on down. Come on down from the foyer, from the family rooms. Come on down. You're the reason that I breathe. Jesus, I believe. All right, they're still coming. They're still coming. We have room for you. We'll wait for you. If that's you, just make your way to the front right now. And as you're walking to the front, just listen to what I want to encourage everybody up here. Hey, guys. Put a smile on your face. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing, all right? I want to encourage you guys. This is the best decision of your entire life. I want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine right over here to my right, your left. See this guy? Good-looking, handsome man over here waving at you. Come on, big wave. This is my friend Antonio, all right? You can call him Tony, all right, or Antonio, or hey, all right? He's cool, all right? Nothing weird's going to go on. He's going to do three things. First thing he's going to do is lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again. That's exciting. Second thing he's going to do, he's going to give you some free stuff, some free literature that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. It's easy reading. It's free. It'll take you about 20, maybe 30 minutes if you read slow. Okay, but it will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. Then finally, he's going to give you what we call a spiritual personal trainer. You say, what is that? Well, it's a friend in church who will help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. So you don't go back serving the devil like you used to. You go on serving God for the rest of your life. It's easy, it's free, and you need to do it. He'll describe how that works, and then he'll let you come right back out. Now listen, I'm going to make a promise to you guys, okay? Here's the promise. Give us one year, one year of your life here at the Rock Church World Outreach Center, sitting consistently under the Word of God. After that year and for the rest of your life, that investment will pay off so much, you will say, man, I never knew it could be this good. Am I telling the truth, everyone? Take their word for it, all right? If you guys will make a left turn, follow Antonio right this way. Love you, Antonio. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God that I'm saved and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. 
You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.